So quiz one, number one. f of x is square root, x squared plus x minus, x squared plus x minus six. All right, so I need to make sure, and we want domain. So I need to make sure what I underlined is greater than or equal to zero. You absolutely can factor, no problem. So, we have an inequality. So it's easy to know when this equals zero. Two and negative three makes it equal zero. So we'll make it equal to zero. However, I don't want it to be just equal to zero. I want zero and more. So zero and then positive. So if you solve this without a graph, you have to decide, well, what combination of x's make a product positive? So two numbers multiplied are greater than or equal to zero. Does that mean, so they could both be positive. What's the other option? Both be negative. Both be negative. So if you solve without a graph, you need some pretty good amount of logic. And this is probably the easiest non-trivial one to solve without a graph. So I'm going to solve it the easy way, which is with the graph. So we have a parabola. It's happy. My x-intercepts, I just wrote them down. 2, negative 3. Parabola is happy. So it looks like this if I graph it. I could find the vertex, but I don't need to get that uh, precise with my graph. I'm going to even be so lazy, I'm not even going to write a y-axis on a graph. This is all I need to answer the question, when is this function greater than or equal to 0? We'll call it g of x. So I just graphed y equals g of x. When is g of x? When is 0? Less than or equal to g of x. So I'll highlight the parts of the graph I want. It's OK to equal 0. And I want the parts that are greater than 0 also. So I shade it in the parts of the graph I want. So the x values go negative infinity, negative 3, union positive 2 to infinity. So that's the parts of the graph that are greater than or equal to 0. So if you need more description on this, uh, somewhere I want to say 1.2, you can go look back at the uh, either your textbook. Your textbook won't have that many details on this. This is really pre-calculus 1 material right here. So you'll have to go back pretty far. But I think in the class, I explained this a little bit about graphing and above or below the x-axis. So that's question number one. Question number two. So we've got two functions. f is x minus 3. g is x squared minus 9. And I wanted to find and simplify g of f of x. So usually I go, I recommend go inside to the outside. So write in what is f of x. And then what we're going to do, if you think of g, if you input a box, you get the box squared minus 9. So all I'm going to do inside the box, I'm going to put an x minus 3. Now my box is a little bit too small. So it's going to look like that. So we get x minus 3 squared minus 9. And I asked you to simplify it. So this is a correct unsimplified. But we will square minus 3x minus 3x minus 6x plus 9, because negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. And your 9s cancel x squared minus 6x. And if you're a factorer, you could write as x times x minus 6. So either of these, I would say, are 100% correct. So I took either answer for full credit right there. And I think if you didn't simplify, it took off one or two points. You could go outside, inside. So I went inside, outside. 
So inside first, and then take care of the outside function. You can go the other way around. So what does g do? g takes f of x, squares it minus 9. So I could write it as f of x squared minus 9, and then just write f of x in here. It's an ugly 3. squared minus 9, and the exact same thing simplifies down. So you can go inside outside, which is the way I recommend, or you can go outside inside the other way around. But either way, as long as you're careful, you get to the same answer. So it goes right into the same thing right there. All right, that was question two. And each was five points. So we'll go to quiz two now. So first question, fx is sine x. So I tried to hint very heavily there would be trig on your second quiz. So there's definitely trig on your second quiz. Every question had to do with trig. So first one was rate, average rate of change. Change from 0 to pi over 2. So it's pretty easy to write this out if you know what you're doing. So we got f of pi over 2 minus f of 0 divided by pi over 2 minus 0. So we got sine pi over 2. Minus sine 0. And pi over 2 minus 0 is just pi over 2. Now you need to know your trig values. So I wrote out first quadrant of the unit circle. I kept everything in the first quadrant of the unit circle, and I showed you how to memorize it. So if you forgot how to memorize it, that's ironic, but you can go back and look at the notes on YouTube and see how did I talk about memorizing it. I just wrote a theta instead of a zero. Should be a zero. All right, so sine pi over two is one, sine zero is zero. So you get one over pi over 2. This is the most dangerous type of fraction because you don't know what's in the numerator, denominator. So this ambiguous fraction right here. So I, I do know what's in the denominator. It's supposed to be grouped like this right here. We have 1 in the numerator and pi over 2 in the denominator. So I'm multiplying by the reciprocal and we get 2 over pi. So I did take a point off That is really bad notation, and I will show you why. We can do a really simple example. So there's two ways to treat this. The problem is division is not associative. That's what the issue is. So the question is, is this 1 half divided by 3, or is this 1 divided by 2 thirds? So let's simplify these. So this will be 1 half times 3 1 third. Which of course is 1 fifth. Just kidding. Making sure you're paying attention. All right, that'd be 1 6. I'll just write a 6 on top. All right, so that's 1 6. Here we have 1 times 3 halves is 3 halves. So 3 halves equal to 1 sixth. No, don't do my taxes. All right, very different right there. So you can't just write 1 over 2 over 3, or in our case, 1 over pi over 2. So hopefully that convinces you why you can't do it. Can you put uh, another line and then a 1 under the 3 of the original equation? That doesn't really fix as to what's grouped with where. Well, it kind of does. It'd be uh, one third divided by one half. It, 
that would make the first one correct. No, you'd need to write parentheses like that. So if you have to say how it's grouped up. You can't just say, oh, there's four things, and therefore it's grouped like this. If it's grouped, if it's grouped the way I wrote it here, you need the parentheses right there. So there will be some, sometimes we use multi-story fractions, but our final answer is we're going to try hard to not have multi-story fractions. Part B, we're going to change from pi over 2 to 0, pi over 2 to pi. So we do the same thing. It's going to be sine pi minus sine pi over 2 divided by pi minus pi over 2. So we get sine pi is 0 minus 1 divided by pi minus pi over 2 is pi over 2. So that's negative 1 times 2 over pi or negative 2 over pi. So there's the two solutions right there. And part C was secant line. with x equals 0, x equals pi over 2. So the two x values we're using are really the ones we used up in part A. So I'm using my slope from part A. Don't need to recompute it. So our slope is 2 over pi. And there is lots of ways to go. You can wa use y equals mx plus b, or you can go y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. I don't care which way you go, as long as you do it carefully. So we get 2 over pi x plus b. So what point does our function go through? There's actually two points I can use. I can either use 0 comma sine 0 or I can use pi over 2 comma sine pi over 2. The easier one is 0 sine 0. So sine of 0 is 0. So we'll go ahead and use this. So our y is 0 equals x is 0 plus b. So b equals 0. And you can write your final answer y equals uh, 2 over pi x. You don't need to write the plus 0. So we got tangent is negative and theta is in quadrant 2. So I wanted a 3, 4, 5 triangle, but that's not actually what I made. So if I draw a triangle, tangent opposite over adjacent. So opposite is 3, adjacent is 5, but one of these two is negative. We're in quadrant 2, so that means our x is negative. So our 5 is negative. Now, unfortunately, the hypotenuse is not going to have a nice value. So we'll just write h squared equals 3 squared plus 5 squared. So we get 9 plus 25 is 34, not 36. So h is plus or minus square root 34. Hypotenuse always positive, no matter what quadrant you're in. So we got square root 34. And then I wanted to know about sine, cosine, and secant. So sine is adjacent, no, opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite is 3 over square root 34. Cos theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, negative 3 over square root 34. And secant theta is 1 over cosine theta. So I'm just taking the reciprocal of our previous answer, 34 over negative square root of 34 over 3. Should be negative 5 over square root of 34? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. I should be using five because that is our adjacent side. All right, so these are our three final answers here. All right, that's both your quizzes. So we'll do one more definition of a limit example. So g of x negative 2 thirds x plus 2. So find lim x approaches let's do x approaches 9 of 2 -third, negative 2 thirds x plus 2 so can I just use the limit rules for this limit it's just polynomial so I'm plugging the values got no weird stuff happening here all right, so go ahead and find that limit. You should get negative 4 for your limit value. So we're going to, when we're proving this using the definition, we're going to start at the end and then work backwards. So we write any epsilon greater than 0. So the last, our conclusion, f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So that's the last part of the definition. And I'm just going to plug in all, so we know f of x, negative 2 thirds x plus 2 minus l, which is negative 4, less than epsilon. And where we're supposed to go to, as we're starting, we're going to do some algebra, and we better get down to Let's see, should be x minus 9 less than something. So the first step is pretty obvious, simplify. So you get negative 2 thirds. plus 6 this looks a little scary what you want to pay attention to don't worry about how to turn the 6 into negative 9 much easier how do you turn negative 2 thirds x into regular x what do you multiply by negative 3 halves so how do you turn negative 2 thirds x into just 1 x you just get that negative 2 thirds out, multiply by negative 3 halves. So that's all we're going to do. So multiply by negative 3 halves, both sides. Ooh, that's going to be bad, isn't it? So what's wrong with multiplying by negative 3 halves? It's a negative, it'll flip the sign. Flips inequality. Flips inequality. Well, let's go ahead and just multiply by positive 3 halves. So 
So see if you can simplify this down to x minus 9. The first step should be really obvious. You're just distributing. So I want to multiply by the absolute value of negative 1. What is the absolute value of negative 1? One? 1. 1. So is that going to flip our inequality? No. Nope. And the good news is I don't need to do anything on the right side. The rule I'm going to use is AB absolute value equals absolute value of A times absolute value of B. So two absolute values multiply together, you can just move the absolute values outside. So we got negative 1 absolute value times negative x plus 9 absolute value. And absolute value of negative 1 There we go. X minus 9 less than 3 over 2 epsilon. There is another way to do it. And if you didn't like that route, I'm multiplying by absolute value negative 1. And I'll do this over here. So do you believe this equation I just wrote down? I didn't really do anything. It was just simple algebra right there. And now I'll use a property right above and say this is absolute value negative 1 times absolute value x minus 9. And of course, absolute value negative 1 is 1. So that's x minus 9. So they're basically negatives of each other. But taking the absolute value doesn't matter that they're negatives of each other. Either way, you're using this uh, absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. So either way, you're using that fact right there. Warning. It's not where I wrote my W. Oh. Warning. There are certain values, for example, if A and B are both positive, they'll be equal. But addition and absolute value are not very good friends. Uh, you actually get the what's called the triangle inequality. So just think about what happens if A or B is not negative. Or if A or B is negative, then the absolute value of the sum is going to be smaller than the absolute value of them individually add it together. So it will be equal if A and B are both positive. But in general, you get what's called the triangle inequality, which I don't think we use at all in calculus. So you won't really need it. Uh, the one I did write down here, the product, is definitely useful. All right, so what's our delta? I know yesterday was a long time ago. That's our delta right there. So I will tell you exactly the type of question that I'll put on your midterm. I'm going to ask you the definition of a limit. So have you memorized the definition? It's somewhere up here if I scroll up. Def of limb. So that's definition of a limit right there. So 
So that'll be part A. And then I'm going to ask you part B, can you use this definition and prove this limit is what you actually say that it is? So it'll be a very easy limit to find. And then you're going to use the definition right here to show me that your limit is actually whatever you tell me. I think we got what, eight for the f one of the first ones we did. And uh, the last the one we just did, we got negative four. So why is it negative four? Because of all this epsilon delta stuff I did right here. That's why it's negative four. And you can do the same thing where you graph it out. You can think about, well, here's my epsilon. So what does my delta have to be? And our slope was negative two thirds, positive two thirds. So our slope was much less steep. So that's why our delta is actually bigger than our epsilon. So if your function is not so steep, your delta actually gets bigger than your epsilon. If your function is more steep, your delta has to be more s smaller than your epsilon. The short answer is it's a reciprocal, reciprocal of the slope, but I need to see the work that you do. Not just, ah, it's a reciprocal of the slope. Maybe I'll give you one point if you just tell me it's a reciprocal of the slope. So that's the end of the definition of a limit. Now I'm going to go to 2, 4, which is one-sided limits. So is, two, is all of chapter 2 going to be on the midterm, or is it just up until 2.3 from chapter 1? Uh, I think I'm going to leave off 2.6, <coughs> the last section of chapter 2. Uh, that's my plan, but I'll tell you definitively tomorrow. Okay. All right, one side limit. We'll start with uh, left limit. So it's, we've seen this low, oh man, limb x approaches c. We put a minus right there f of x equals l. So this will be a left limit, and left because that little minus sign that appears in the exponent. So that's a left limit. Now normally we think about approaching the x value c from both sides, but a left limit says what happens when you approach only from the left. So don't look at the right side. Don't look at the actual y value at c. You want to look approaching on the left. Or I should say approaching on the left. You can use the definition, or you can look up the definition of the left or right limit. It, the only difference is, normally we get x minus c is less than delta. But if x is already less than c, so we get x right there. If x is less than c, what would I get if I did x minus c, positive or negative? If x is less than c. If that's hard to see, start with x less than c, x minus c less than 0. So if I basically switch around the order, c minus x, I'll have positive. So what happens is you don't use this x minus c less than delta, or absolute value x minus c. So this is what happens. You don't need the absolute value anymore, but on a left limit, x is smaller, so it's going to be c minus x. But don't worry, we're not going to need to do definition for one side of limits, at least not on your quiz or your midterm in this case. All right, there's a left limit, and a right limit's really similar. We just write x approaches c, and with a positive a plus in the exponent. So in this case, we have, so c is bigger, x is bigger than c, so we don't need absolute values anymore on that. So the only difference in the definition, your absolute values disappear. So we have, 
a theorem. Lim x approaches c f of x equals l exactly when lim x approaches c on the left equals lim x approaches c on the right equals l. So your limit exists when the left and right limits agree. So your limit exists exactly when left limit equals right limit. So if they agree, you got your full limit. And we're going to draw a graph here. We're just going to use the y values 1 and 2 and x values 1, 2, and 3. So this function we'll call f of x right here. I want to find a couple limits. So we'll go limit x approaches 1 from the negative side. Lim x approaches 1 from the positive side. All right, so find these two limits. So what happens to the left of 1? What are your y values approaching? What are they approaching to the right of 1? So on the left, you're approaching 0. Down here, you're getting close to. You're approaching 0, so you're moving close to this y value right there on the left. On the right, you are approaching the y value of 1. So on the left, you're approaching 0. On the right, you're approaching 1. So the two-sided limit doesn't have a plus or a minus. So using this theorem, did the left limit equal the right limit? No. Nope. So the theorem says the limit is L exactly when left limit equals right limit. So what we get is limit does not exist because they disagree. So we write does not exist. Can I have one it won't. Sometimes you have to put none. None. You can like the and then it'll only take a lowercase n. It won't take an uppercase n. Maybe that's what the problem is. I thought I wrote lowercase. And sometimes it just wants you to put an n, too. That's another thing. Yeah, Does it say in the problem, though? The one with the n, it did say it's with an n or a y. Sometimes I'll double check that I made it lowercase, and I think I did. Yeah, it, it, it's ambiguous. And it's random throughout the whole thing. Like yeah, uh, yeah, and sometimes it's in, sometimes it's DNE, sometimes, yeah, they're not. The, the same. problem with web work is that they're written by different people. There's not like one final author who makes everything the same. All right. All right, so this one will be does not exist. And let's do the same thing left and right side of two. So we'll play the same game right around two. So I don't know what happens left of two, right of two. So we'll go left limit first, right limit second.
So left limit should be 2, right limit should be 2. And our theorem says, if left limit agrees with right limit, that's your limit. So our limit is 2. Even though if it's on 2, it's 1. So yeah, what is f of 2? One. Is 1. That doesn't have anything to do with the actual limit value. Because remember, one thing you can always write, the limit x is not 2, x is close to 2. Okay. So the fact that f of 2 doesn't agree is not relevant for the limit. Now what this leads to is, let's see, next section. We're about to get into continuity. And continuity, if your limit doesn't match your value, that's what it means to be continuous. You need all three to agree. So we'll get to continuity. So these don't match. We would say uh, f is not continuous at x equals 2. And we'll get to the whole section on continuous. So the fact that the value doesn't agree with the limit is fine with the limit, but it means their function is not going to be continuous. That's irrelevant because remember it's x close to 2, not equal to 2. So like this, the actual value, not relevant for the limit. Uh, we can see that you know if you're trying to walk along this function, you'll fall through the hole right there. So that's what it means to be continuous. You, it's a nice path the whole way, a nice continuous path the whole way. So like for the examples we did on this, we have x approaches to the left. So we have 0 on the left and 1 on the right. I think we're approaching 0 on the left and 1 on the right. It doesn't matter which of these two is filled in, or neither of them can be filled in. That also doesn't affect the limit. So the most important thing is close to, but not actually equal to. Now I think, because I didn't look up the definition of a limit, I just did it off the top of my head. I believe there is also a that needs to be greater than 0. Because what that means, what happens if x equals 4? What would be, what's 4 minus 4? Zero. 0. So, oh my goodness. That's not the definition. That's the definition of a limit right there. And the, that, uh, that will update for when we go back to look at it. So we yeah, not on YouTube, but on the, the notes, yeah. Now, if you missed that little zero greater than, I probably won't count off for that. Punish you for a mistake I made. It's your parents' job, it's not my job. Just kidding. Sort of. All right, how much time do we have? Two minutes. So I'm not gonna go over why these last limits are correct. We'll just say they are because I said so. Another parental move. All right, so we got some special limits. Lim theta approaches zero. And this is when theta is in radians, which it always will be in this class, pretty much. Another special limit. So
So on these limits right here, you just basically need to memorize them. So I don't want to take the time to go through why they are. You can look through your book if you want to. It's pretty similar to the inequalities that we looked at before. So you have your midterm is Friday. And you have your quizzes back, so you can study from those. A really good resource is your textbook. There are problems. If you haven't discovered the problems in your textbook, they're pretty useful. They're broken into each section has subsections of problems. So if you felt like the definition of a limit was kind of tricky, a lot of students feel that that's hard. You want to go through and do some of the problems out of 2.3, for example. All the odd answers, almost all the odd answers in your book. <laughs>